Funding for Prairie Sportsman is provided by the Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center, designed for you for any season. Whether you're there for business pleasure or just plain relaxing, there's something for everyone. The Arrowwood, located on beautiful Lake Darling, just outside of Alexandria, Minnesota. And by the outdoor enthusiasts who are members of this station. Hello and welcome to Prairie Sportsman. I'm Rich Massey and I'll be taking you on a journey to visit our outdoor world. We're glad to have you with us and we hope you enjoy our show. We're going to introduce you to Ted Takasaki, a professional walleye fisherman and his family. We'll take a look at the Nature Conservancy and its work with restoring prairie chickens in western Minnesota, and we'll venture to Staples, Minnesota and the Lil Moran Hunt Club for a look at dog training. Prairie Sportsman is coming up next. Ted Takasaki is living the American dream. Currently, he is the president of the Lindy Tackle Company, a Minnesota-based fishing tackle manufacturer. It's always fun for Ted to join his wife, Lori, and their daughter, Christy, on another family fishing outing. Ted Takasaki has two high-pressure jobs. He's a professional tournament angler, and he's the president of Lindy Little Joe Tackle Company in Brainerd. Ted knows the perfect way to relieve his stress. Ted Takasaki is going fishing, but who's that going with him? Ted's a type A personality when he gets on the water, and today he's got guests in the boat. Looks like Ted's found his spot. Immediately, Ted's at work. And so is his wife, Lori, and his daughter, Christy. This is one of Ted's family days on Big Sand Lake, north of Park Rapids, Minnesota. Ted's fishing for fun today with the girls, and fun is what he gets. Lori's got one. Is he still on there? It may not be the Ted. biggest fish caught, but Lori hooks the first fish of the day. All right, Christy, you're going to net? Christy's going to help out Mom with the net and find out what she caught. Oh, oh a perch! <laughs> Well, a fish is a fish. Although it's not a keeper, it was the first catch of the day. Now Lori has the task ahead of her to unhook this fish and release it. And while the catch and release process goes on, Ted sets the hook. Christy, you want to get it? She's practicing for netting. We just kind of working right along this real sharp break using a lindy rig and a no snag sinker and uh, that fish just smoked it now that was one where he just hammered that that big old chub you see him little punk? oh there he comes there he comes there he comes okay oh i'm gonna get him all right yes good net job <laughs> All right. 
they just are gorgeous fish out here just beautiful walleyes dark golden color that was a good net job <laughs> Christy's been uh, out here fishing with me since she was basically uh, about three and a half years old I think she <laughs> caught her first four pound walleye back then so and she's 16 now Boy, he's really got that chub all the way down. This is a challenge for a lot of fishermen. If that hook is set deep, it takes a little trick to pop the hook out so that the fish can be returned to the water safely. And Ted knows just how to do it. There it goes. Okay. Well, I think we'll let this one go. Christy's lucky to be part of a great fishing family. Ted will release this beautiful walleye. You want to let him go, little punk? You let him go. You want me to do it? Yeah. Okay. All right. Here he goes. Beauty. <laughs> yeah. At this point, we'll take any size. So catch anything. Now. Ted and the girls put those chubs back into the water and back into action. Well, I just marked another fish. I think it's going right by Mom's rod. Are you on the bottom? Ted's got a beautiful yeah. hand-built rod crafted for him by his daughter, Christy. It's a beautiful wrap job in terms of just customizing the rod. And she put some Japanese characters that stand for good luck and then a, a little feather built right into the blank there. A little good luck goes a long way and the fish are biting today. Ted hooks into another one and Christy is ready with the net. You see him? Mama must see him. But Ted thinks this one feels a little different. Oh, look at that. I was thinking that it felt a little different. <laughs> yeah, small mouth. That's a big one, too. Pretty nice smallmouth. These northern Minnesota lakes are quite amazing in terms of the species of fish and all the different kind of fish that you can catch. I mean, that right there is about a four pound smallie. Gotta love that. They're a lot of fun to catch, too. He's got that, that chub all the way down, too. A smallmouth bass is a lucky catch, but this one is headed back to the water. Beauty. They're known for making big long runs and jumps. <laughs> I still like walleye though. All right, let's put this guy back in the water. And so goes the day. The family gets back to work Prairie Sportsman says so long for now until we come back again to visit with the Takasaki fishing family. You know, prairie chickens haven't been around for a while, but they've been reintroduced to the flat lands of the Chippewa Prairie in west central Minnesota. Now let's join Brian Winter of the Nature Conservancy as he gives us some insight on prairie chickens. It's great to be here on the Nature Conservancy's Chippewa Prairie, which is part of this Lacquaparo, Minnesota River, Upper Minnesota River Valley complex. And we're, we're standing right now, we're in the center of a booming ground, a really a historic booming ground. It's the first time and the first place that prairie chickens boomed in the Minnesota River Valley for over 60 years. 
Cray chickens are, have this wonderful display, and as long as you sort of hide yourself in a small blind like this, they're very tolerant of humans in terms of coming out here, sitting right amongst their mating and reproductive, reproductive ritual, and watching out the flaps in this blind. If you were to stand out here, they would all flush and fly off into escape cover and disappear. But if you get in, zip up the door, you can observe them very up close and personal. The other thing you'll notice about this booming ground is it's very short structured vegetation. This is native prairie that was hayed off in the summer of 2003. And prairie chickens seek out areas of very low vegetation structure. So a hayed prairie, a grazed prairie, even a cultivated field will work perfectly for what they desire for booming grounds. And the whole point on a booming ground for males, the individual males that are out on this ground, is to be observed by females. And so they don't want to be in tall grass. They want to be seen by the females. And so that's why they seek out these very low vegetation um, structure areas. Prairie chickens, when the, the hens come here, this is, this is where all the mating occurs. So as the females come in here, they, they choose. They are, they, they're literally in control. The males may think they are, but the females do the choosing. And when they select and mate with a male, they then go back to that taller vegetation around this booming ground, select a nest site, and an average prairie chicken nest will contain 12 to 15 eggs, uh, particularly on their first nesting attempts. And it'll take them about 12 to 15 days to actually establish that clutch of eggs. So they'll lay roughly an egg a day. So there's a couple week period there where that nest is vulnerable to a predator as they establish the clutch. The incubation period, once they start sitting on that nest to incubate the eggs uh, to eventually obviously move the, towards hatching of the chicks, that's another 28 days. So when you think of uh, you know, that mother prairie chicken out there in the grass, her nest has been out there for five to six weeks essentially, vulnerable to things like skunks and fox and raccoons, various predators that will move through the grass looking for that type of food source. So it's, in some ways it's almost a miracle that any nests hatch, um, but they do and they actually have pretty high nesting success. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% of most nests established actually turn out to be successful. Now that varies with habitat quality, with any given year, what the predator, you know, prey populations are like. So, you know, you can never say that it's always 50%, but that's on average. As you notice, they, they erect what we call pinnae, which look like rabbit ears that they erect over the top of their head. And uh, the older the male, the, the more mature the male, the longer those pinnae are. Um, in addition, they have those bright orange air sacs on the side of their neck, which they inflate with air. And, it, and those air sacs help, are sort of the resonance chambers, which, give, which allows the prairie chicken to make that sort of that that call that that mysterious call that they're known for some people have described it as the old Muldoon call and if you kind of you know listen to the all the wonderful noises they're making you hear this oh Muldoon you know you kind of hear that call and it just kind of echoes across the prairie a nickname of prairie chickens is actually kettle drummer and if you think of um, the old cast iron skillet hanging from the porch and if you went up and whacked that with a hammer and you get that reverberating sound that and you can hear a lot of that today out here on the booming ground And then you also hear hoop calls, which the males tend to make those hoop calls when there's females on the ground. They, they really hoop it up when the girls arrive. So there's all these sights and sounds that make it such a, such a wonderful you know, experience to cherish. Um, in addition, you know, when they're displaying, they fan out their tail, they drop their wings down, they stamp with their feet. There's so many things going on, you can't begin to describe it all. You really have to come out here and experience for yourself. The hard work of conservation, and it is really hard work, can only be done with key partnerships of individuals. and and it's partnerships with groups like the Nature Conservancy, the Minnesota Prairie Chicken Society, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Pheasants Forever, and private landowners. Um, it really takes a strong partnership of all those individuals to get the hard work of conservation done today.
As a measure of respect to the resource, every good hunter needs a well-trained dog. We're going to the Lil Moran Hunt Club near Staples, Minnesota to see a dog trainer share his expertise. Nestled in the meadows and woodlands just outside of Staples, Minnesota, the Lil Moran Hunt Club offers an all-season hunting resort and sporting clay destination for people from all over the Midwest and beyond. Steve Grossman, owner of the Lil Moran Hunt Club and professional dog trainer, invited us to a gathering of hunting dog enthusiasts who were seeking to gain knowledge and proper training techniques. But if a mistake is made, we can step in and correct it and show how to go about correcting it. And we're teaching that dog something every time that we do something with him. Devin Inglove of Center Creek Kennels in Monette, Missouri, was also on hand to offer his direction in training your dog in obedience and handling during the hunt. And they don't escalate, that'll, that'll get you a long way through the program. After the routine introductions and an explanation of the day's events, Steve led us to a grassy area to demonstrate and cover various aspects of training and controlling your dog in an open field situation. The thing that you don't want to do at this point is just let a dog go helter-skelter without any kind of control on it via a check cord at this point. There's a point in time when I'm assuming that most of you guys here and people here that your dog number one is the gun dog first. It's not a family pet. The first thing evaluated is the dog's natural born instincts. I'll grab this little squirt. Steve shows us an example with one of the dogs in the field. We're working with puppies. We want it to be fun and we want it to encourage the pup. We don't want to discourage them. Personally, that's what I like to see in a dog. I like to see that aggressiveness. We can tone that down. Good pup. But I want to see the drive to be able to go out and do the job and get it done. We were very fortunate today to have uh, Devin Inglove, a good friend of mine from uh, Monette, Missouri, uh, Center Creek Kennels. Devin's a wonderful young trainer, uh, been training for 20 plus years. So we're fortunate to have his knowledge from a gun dog standpoint and in a guide dog standpoint. Field training consists of many aspects, including quartering, handling, and many hours of bird work. To achieve the proper results, a dog needs to be confident in all kinds of cover. See what he's looking for? He's looking for a little bit more scent on that bird. He's wanting a little bit stronger scent, and that his tail is telling you that. He's ticking, he's flagging. Devin demonstrated a harmless technique that is effective in locking the bird's wings for training your dog in the field. Handlers were able to ask questions and received hands-on information in proper techniques. And this allowed the trainers to evaluate the dogs firsthand. Never, I never take a dog in the field without a car to court on. Steve and Devin demonstrated various tips for the eager group of dog handlers that were fortunate enough to attend the event at the Lil Moran Hunt Club. Every dog owner posed questions to the training team throughout the day and felt the benefits of being able to witness the training techniques firsthand. This seminar today is, is designed to help people become better dog handlers and understand their dogs better, as well as teach them training techniques and things which are going to help them and make their dog a better dog. And it's fun for training your own dog yourself. And so these are some of the things we're doing to give them that kind of an opportunity. And make them come back to you. And now when I'm starting them out, it's hold. I'll caution it just so they don't spit that dummy out. To go to the ground without a training situation like this again, I find I lose control of the situation. If I take a bumper and throw it for him, and the dog goes out halfway and goes off and wandering, then I've lost my, my control. Everything kind of from A to Z, from a building to foundation, getting back to the field with a finished animal to show you just how things can work together once the dog is already trained and, and once the dog is trained, how well a partner that dog can be as a, as a gun dog partner for you. Training a gun dog takes a lot of time and patience. But the results are very rewarding when you can take your dog afield and give a short command of whoa, and in an instant your dog is locked in stance. Whoa. See the importance of the whoa command. Now I'd like to see her come in and back her without whoa her, and she generally does, but in that situation, the importance of the whoa command, it stops anything else from happening. We got it all fixed right there. And when you get it all done, if you're, if you're constantly using one or two word commands, 
consistently, then it's not, whoa, 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 whoa. And that's what ends up happening. We're lucky and fortunate enough to be able to put something like this together and thank Nutrisource for being one of the sponsors and, and, and providing us with the dog food for all the participants and things. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's been a good day. We enjoyed our day at the club, listening and learning along with the group of dog owners. It's just as important for the handler to be educated as it is for the dog to learn how to be disciplined in the field. We thank the fine folks at Lil Moran Hunt Club for inviting us to share in the day of training and look forward to the day when we can visit again. Let's look at a tip from Chef Kurt Anderson, our cooking guru from Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center near Alexandria, Minnesota. Hi, sportsmen. Today's topic is knife sharpening and maintenance. Now, every good sportsman should have a knife in his, a field knife in his kit that he can use specifically for outdoors. Here's an example of mine. She's small, but she's handy. You'll notice a couple of intricate things. The blade runs all the way through the handle. The handle itself is wood and it's held by rivets. Another knife that works very well, once you've gotten the meat back home, you're going to need a fillet knife. One of my favorites is this rascal with a curved blade. You'll see it has a polyformed handle, but the curved blade will help me get into areas that I maybe couldn't get in otherwise. It also helps well with trying to remove the silver skin from the meat. The next knife I really enjoy is a flank knife. This knife is a lot sturdier has a very sharp, solid blade. It's weighted very well, so a lot of the weight is backed by the handle. This knife will also work very well for cutting larger roasts apart. Another knife that you should have at home is a chef's knife. You'll use this one a lot in dicing and julienne work for your meat. It'll help you slice the meat a lot thinner. And finally, one of my favorite knives is a scimitar. Now this particular knife is rather heavy, well weighted, and in this case, it too has that great curve that allows me to get up in areas when I'm removing large cuts of meat from the carcass and from the bone structure. I can get it all in one shot. Uh, because of its weight, it helps ease of cutting. Now, a couple of things that are unique. This particular knife with a wooden handle has a little trick that I recommend that you do every once in a while. Dip it in your deep fat fryer for about 15 seconds. What'll happen is it'll cook the bacteria that'll develop right here in the handle and it'll also keep the wood freshened so it stays on its rivets. This particular knife is 10 years old and you see it looks very good in the handle. Now for a quick tip on sharpening. In the past we used flat stones with oil to sharpen but now the newer technology revolves around these handy dandy little sharpeners you could buy uh, just about anywhere. They come in different grades uh, this one here, for example, the black one, has a white ceramic stone that the knife would run against. This one here has a magnetic metal stone. Now, part of the difference here, you just want to hold and draw the knife through very carefully. Now, this is a job where you don't want a lot of people around you because you might cut yourself if you were to get bumped. Once you've straightened the edge, use a steel. Make sure your hand placement on your steel is behind the crown of the steel. As you can see on this crown, there's a few times I've missed, and that saves your finger. The degree marker is about 15 degrees here for the knife to run. And you're going to move the knife across against the edge of the blade, like so, and that'll help true off the edge of your knife. Now your knife is sharp. Good luck hunting. you have a photo you'd like to share, we'd like to see it. Here's a photo of my dad with his water spaniel pups in 1905. And here's a photo of pheasant hunting in Swift County, 1949. Send us a digital picture by email or an outdoor photo by mail to this address. We'd like to include your photo in our show. Your photos will be returned. Visit our website for more updates and photos. Thank you. Hi, 
am Ted Takasaki with a tip of the day. When it comes to fishing with plastic grubs like this Munchies Thumping Grub, I've had a lot of folks ask me about how to put that grub on a jig. This is how you do it. The first step is to take your jig and then measure the grub with the grub head right tight to the ball of the jig and then see where the hook actually comes out the grub body itself. The next step is to center the hook point on the head of the grub and then slowly thread that grub body onto the shank of the jig hook and then where you measured out where that hook point came out on the body of the grub that's where the hook point comes out. Now you've got the hook point coming out right where you had measured it. The body is on nice and straight and I always like to have the tail hooking downwards for the most action. Now you've got the grub body that's straight on the jig with the tail pointing down for maximum action and catch more fish. Thanks for coming along and tune in next time to Prairie Sportsman. Funding for Prairie Sportsman is provided by the Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center, designed for you for any season. Whether you're there for business pleasure or just plain relaxing, there's something for everyone. The Arrowwood, located on beautiful Lake Darling, just outside of Alexandria, Minnesota. And by the outdoor enthusiasts who are members of this station.